Chapter Twenty One If Love Were All It was night, and I was in the cell wherein the King had lain in the castle of Zenda. The great pipe that Rupert of Hentzau had nicknamed Jacob's Ladder was gone, and the lights in the room across the moat twinkled in the darkness. All was still. The din and clash of strife were gone. I had spent the day hidden in the forest, from the time when Fritz had led me off, leaving Zapt with the princess. Under cover of dusk, muffled up, I had been brought to the castle, and lodged where I now lay. Though three men had died there, two of them by my hand, I was not troubled by ghosts. I had thrown myself on a pallet by the window, and was looking out on the black water. Johann, the keeper, still pale from his wound, but not much hurt besides, had brought me supper. He told me that the king was doing well, that he had seen the princess, that she and he, Zapt and Fritz, had been long together. Marshal Strakens was gone to Streltzau, Black Michael lay in his coffin, and Antoinette de Maubin watched by him. Had I not heard from the chapel priests singing mass for him? Outside there were strange rumours afloat. Some said that the prisoner of Zender was dead. Some that he had vanished yet alive. Some that he was a friend who had served the king well in some adventure in England. Others that he had discovered the duke's plots, and had therefore been kidnapped by him. One or two shrewd fellows shook their heads, and said only that they would say nothing, but they had suspicions that more was to be known than was known, if Colonel Zapt would tell all he knew. Thus Johann chattered till I sent him away, and lay there alone, thinking, not of the future, but as a man is wont to do when stirring things have happened to him, rehearsing the events of the past weeks, and wondering how strangely they had fallen out. And above me, in the stillness of the night, I heard the standards flapping against their poles, for Black Michael's banner hung there at half-mast. High and above it the royal flag of Ruritania, floating for one night more over my head. Habit grows so quick that only by an effort did I recall that it floated no longer for me. Presently Fritz von Tallenheim came into the room. I was standing then by the window. The glass was opened, and I was idly fingering the cement which clung to the masonry where Jacob's ladder had been. He told me briefly that the king wanted me, and together we crossed the drawbridge, and entered the room that had been Black Michael's. The king was lying there in bed. Our doctor from Tarlenheim was in attendance on him, and whispered to me that my visit must be brief. The king held out his hand and shook mine. Fritz and the doctor withdrew to the window. I took the king's ring from my finger, and placed it on his. "'I have tried not to dishonour it, sire,' said I. "'I can't talk much to you,' he said in a weak voice. "'I have had a great fight with Zapt and the Marshal, "'for we have told the Marshal everything. "'I wanted to take you to Strelsau and keep you with me, "'and tell everyone of what you had done, "'and you would have been my best and nearest friend, Cousin Rudolph. "'But they tell me I must not.' and that the secret must be kept, if kept it can be. "'They are right, sire. Let me go. My work here is done.' "'Yes, it is done, as no man but you could have done it. When they see me again I shall have my beard on. I shall—yes, faith, I shall be wasted with sickness. They will not wonder that the king looks changed in face.' "'Cousin, I shall try to let them find him changed in nothing else. "'You have shown me how to play the king.' "'Sire,' said I, "'I can take no praise from you. "'It is by the narrowest grace of God "'that I was not a worse traitor than your brother.' "'He turned inquiring eyes on me, "'but a sick man shrinks from puzzles, "'and he had no strength to question me. "'His glance fell on Flavia's ring, which I wore.' I thought he would question me about it, but, after fingering it idly, he let his head fall on his pillow. "'I don't know when I shall see you again,' he said, faintly, almost listlessly. 
"'If I can ever serve you again, sire,' I answered. His eyelids closed. Fritz came with the doctor. I kissed the king's hand and let Fritz lead me away. I have never seen the king since. Outside, Fritz turned, not to the right, back towards the drawbridge, but to the left, and without speaking led me upstairs, through a handsome corridor in the chateau. "'Where are we going?' I asked. Looking away from me, Fritz answered, "'She has sent for you. When it is over, come back to the bridge. I'll wait for you there.' "'What does she want?' said I, breathing quickly. He shook his head. "'Does she know everything?' "'Yes, everything.' He opened a door, and gently pushing me in, closed it behind me. I found myself in a drawing-room, small and richly furnished. At first I thought that I was alone, for the light that came from a pair of shaded candles on the mantelpiece was very dim. But presently I discerned a woman's figure standing by the window. I knew it was the princess, and I walked up to her, fell on one knee, and carried the hand that hung by her side to my lips. She neither moved nor spoke. I rose to my feet, and, piercing the gloom with my eager eyes, saw her pale face and the gleam of her hair, and before I knew I spoke softly. Flavia! She trembled a little, and looked round. Then she darted to me, taking hold of me. "'Don't stand! Don't stand! No, you mustn't! You're hurt! Sit down! Here! Here!' She made me sit on a sofa, and put her hand on my forehead. "'How hot your head is!' she said, sinking on her knees by me. Then she laid her head against me, and I heard her murmur, "'My darling, how hot your head is!' Somehow love gives even to a dull man the knowledge of his lover's heart. I had come to humble myself and pray pardon for my presumption. But what I said now was, "'I love you with all my heart and soul.' For what troubled and shamed her? Not her love for me, but for the fear that I had counterfeited the lover as I had acted the king, and taken her kisses with a smothered smile. "'With all my life and heart,' said I, as she clung to me, "'always, from the first moment I saw you in the cathedral, there has been but one woman in the world to me, and there will be no other. But God forgive me the wrong I've done you.' "'They made you do it,' she said quickly, and she added, raising her head and looking in my eyes, "'It might have made no difference if I'd known it. "'It was always you, never the king.' "'And she raised herself up and kissed me. "'I meant to tell you,' said I. "'I was going to on the night of the ball in Strelsau, "'when Zapt interrupted me. "'After that I, I couldn't. "'I couldn't risk losing you before—before before I, I must.' "'My darling, for you I nearly left the king to die. "'I know, I know. "'What are we to do now, Rudolf?' "'I put my arm round her, and held her up, while I said, "'I am going away to-night.' "'Ah, oh, no, no!' she cried. "'Not to-night. "'I must go to-night, before more people have seen me. "'And how would you have me stay, sweetheart, except if I could come with you?' she whispered, very low. "'My God!' said I, roughly. "'Don't talk about that!' And I thrust her a little back from me. "'Why not? I love you. You're as good a gentleman as the King.' Then I was false to all that I should have held by, for I caught her in my arms and prayed her, in words that I will not write, to come with me, daring all Ruritania to take her from me. And for a while she listened, with wondering, dazzled eyes. But as her eyes looked on me, I grew ashamed, and my voice died away in broken murmurs and stammerings. And at last I was silent. She drew herself away from me, and stood against the wall, while I sat on the edge of the sofa, trembling in every limb, knowing what I had done, loathing it, obstinate not to undo it. So we rested a long time. "'I am mad,' I said sullenly. "'I love your madness, dear,' she answered. Her face was away from me, but I caught the sparkle of a tear on her cheek, 
I clutched the sofa with my hand and held myself there. "'Is love the only thing?' she asked, in low, sweet tones that seemed to bring a calm even to my wrung heart. "'If love were the only thing, I would follow you, in rags if need be, to the world's end, for you hold my heart in the hollow of your hand. But is love the only thing?' I made her no answer. It gives me shame now to think that I would not help her. She came near me and laid her hand on my shoulder. I put my hand up and held hers. I know people write and talk as if it were. Perhaps for some fate lets it be. Ah, if I were one of them. But if love had been the only thing, you would have let the king die in his cell. I kissed her hand. Honour binds a woman, too, Rudolph. My honour lies in being true to my country and my house. I don't know why God has let me love you, but I know that I must stay. Still I said nothing, and she, pausing a while, then went on. Your ring will always be on my finger, your heart in my heart, the touch of your lips on mine. But you must go, and I must stay. Perhaps I must do what it kills me to think of doing. I knew what she meant, and a shiver ran through me, but I could not utterly fail beside her. I rose and, and took her hand. Do what you will, or what you must, I said. I think God shows his purposes to such as you. My part is lighter, for your ring shall be on my finger and your heart in mine, and no touch, save of your lips, will ever be on mine. So may God comfort you, my darling. There struck on our ears the sound of singing. The priests in the chapel were singing masses for the souls of those who lay dead. They seemed to chant a requiem over our buried joy, to pray forgiveness for our love that would not die. The soft, sweet, pitiful music rose and fell as we stood opposite each other, her hands in mine. My queen and my beauty, said I. "'My lover and true knight,' she said. "'Perhaps we shall never see one another again. "'Kiss me, my dear, and go.' "'I kissed her as she bade me, "'but at the last she clung to me, "'whispering nothing but my name, "'and that over and over again, "'and again and again. "'And then I left her. "'Rapidly I walked down to the bridge. "'Zapt and Fritz were waiting for me. Under their directions I changed my dress, and muffling my face as I had done more than once before, I mounted with them at the door of the castle, and we three rode through the night and on to the breaking day, and found ourselves at a little roadside station just over the border of Ruritania. The train was not quite due, and I walked with them in a meadow by a little brook while we waited for it. They promised to send me all news— they overwhelmed me with kindness. Even old Zapt was touched to gentleness, while Fritz was half unmanned. I listened in a kind of dream to all they said. Rudolph, 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 still rang in my ears, a burden of sorrow and of love. At last they saw that I could not heed them, and we walked up and down in silence, till Fritz touched me on the arm and I saw a mile or more away the blue smoke of the train. Then I held out a hand to each of them. "'We are all but half men this morning,' said I, smiling. "'But we have been men, eh, Sapt and Fritz, old friends? We have run a good course between us.' "'We have defeated traitors and set the king firm on his throne,' said Zapt. Then Fritz von Tarlenheim suddenly, before I could discern his purpose or stay him, uncovered his head, and bent as he used to do, and kissed my hand. And, as I snatched it away, he said, trying to laugh, "'Heaven doesn't always make the right men kings.' Old Zapp twisted his mouth as he wrung my hand. "'The devil has his share in most things,' said he. The people at the station looked curiously at the tall man with the muffled face, but we took no notice of their glances. I stood with my two friends, and waited till the train came up to us. Then we shook hands again, saying nothing, and both this time, 
and indeed from old Zapt it seemed strange, bared their heads, and so stood still till the train bore me away from their sight, so that it was thought that some great man travelled privately for his pleasure from the little station that morning, whereas in truth it was only I, Rudolf Rassendil, an English gentleman, a cadet of a good house, but a man of no wealth, nor position, nor of much rank. They would have been disappointed to know that. Yet had they known all, they would have looked more curiously still. For be I what I might now, I had been for three months a king, which, if not a thing to be proud of, is at least an experience to have undergone. Doubtless I should have thought more of it, had there not echoed through the air, from the towers of Zenda that we were leaving far away, into my ears and into my heart, the cry of a woman's love. Rudolph! 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 Hark! I hear it now. Chapter 22 Present, Past, and Future The details of my return home can have but little interest. I went straight to the Tyrol, and spent a quiet fortnight, mostly on my back, for a severe chill developed itself, and I was also the victim of a nervous reaction, which made me weak as a baby. As soon as I had reached my quarters, I sent an apparently careless postcard to my brother, announcing my good health and prospective return. That would serve to satisfy the inquiries as to my whereabouts, which were probably still vexing the prefect of the police of Strelsau. I let my moustache and imperial grow again, and as hair comes quickly on my face, they were respectable, though not luxuriant, by the time that I landed myself in Paris, and called on my friend George Featherly. My interview with him was chiefly remarkable for the number of unwilling but necessary falsehoods that I told, and I rallied him unmercifully when he told me that he had made up his mind that I had gone in the track of Madame de Maubon to Strelsau. The lady, it appears, was back in Paris, but was living in great seclusion, a fact for which gossip found no difficulty in accounting. Did not all the world know of the treachery and death of Duke Michael? Nevertheless, George bade Bernard Bertrand be of good cheer, for, said he flippantly, a live poet is better than a dead duke. Then he turned on me and asked, What have you been doing to your moustache? To tell the truth, I answered, assuming a sly air, a man now and then has reasons for wishing to alter his appearance, but it's coming on very well again. What? Then I wasn't so far out. "'If not the fair Antoinette, there was a charmer.' "'There is always a charmer,' said I, sententiously. "'But George would not be satisfied till he had wormed out of me. "'He took much pride in his ingenuity. "'An absolutely imaginary love affair, "'attended with the proper soupçon of scandal, "'which had kept me all this time in the peaceful regions of the Tyrol. "'In return for this narrative, "'George regaled me with a great deal of what he called inside information.' known only to diplomats, as the true course of events in Ruritania, the plots and counterplots. In his opinion, he told me, with a significant nod, there was more to be said for Black Michael than the public supposed, and he hinted at a well-founded suspicion that the mysterious prisoner of Zenda, concerning whom a good many paragraphs had appeared, was not a man at all. But—here I had much ado not to smile— a woman disguised as a man, and that strife between the king and his brother for this imaginary lady's favour was at the bottom of their quarrel. "'Perhaps it was Madame de Maubin herself,' I suggested. "'No,' said George decisively. "'Antoinette de Maubin was jealous of her, and betrayed the duke to the king for that reason. And to confirm what I said, it's well known that the Princess Flavia is now extremely cold to the king, after having been most affectionate.' At this point I changed the subject, and escaped from George's inspired delusions. But if diplomats never know anything more than they had succeeded in finding out in this instance, they appear to me to be somewhat expensive luxuries. While in Paris I wrote to Antoinette, though I did not venture to call upon her. I received in return a very affecting letter, in which she assured me that the King's generosity and kindness, no less than her regard for me, bound her conscience to absolute secrecy. 
she expressed the intention of settling in the country, and withdrawing herself entirely from society. Whether she carried out her designs I have never heard, but as I have not met her, or heard news of her up to this time, it is probable that she did. There is no doubt that she was deeply attached to the Duke of Strelsau, and her conduct at the time of his death proved that no knowledge of the man's real character was enough to root her regard for him out of her heart. I had one more battle left to fight, a battle that would, I knew, be severe, and was bound to end in my complete defeat. Was I not back from the Tyrol without having made any study of its inhabitants, institutions, scenery, fauna, flora, or other features? Had I not simply wasted my time in my usual frivolous, good-for-nothing way? That was the aspect of the matter which I was obliged to admit would present itself to my sister-in-law, and against a verdict based on such evidence I had really no defence to offer. It may be supposed, then, that I presented myself in Park Lane in a shamefaced, sheepish fashion. On the whole my reception was not so alarming as I had feared. It turned out that I had done not what Rose wished, but, the next best thing, what she had prophesied. She had declared that I should make no notes, record no observations, gather no materials. My brother, on the other hand, had been weak enough to maintain that a really serious resolve had at length animated me. When I returned empty-handed, Rose was so occupied in triumphing over Burlesdon that she let me down quite easily, devoting the greater part of her reproaches to my failure to advertise my friends of my whereabouts. "'We've wasted a lot of time trying to find you,' she said. "'I know you have,' said I. "'Half our ambassadors have led weary lives on my account. George Featherly told me so. But why should you have been anxious? I can take care of myself.' "'Oh, it wasn't that,' she cried scornfully. "'But I wanted to tell you about Sir Jacob Borrodale. "'You know he's got an embassy. "'At least he will have in a month, "'and he wrote to say he hoped you would go with him.' "'Where's he going to?' "'He's going to succeed Lord Topham at Strelsau, said she. "'You couldn't have a nicer place, short of Paris.' "'Strelsau, hmm, said I, glancing at my brother. "'Oh, that doesn't matter,' exclaimed Rose, impatiently. "'Now, you will go, won't you?' "'I don't know that I care about it.' "'Oh, you're too exasperating. "'And I don't think I can go to Strelsau. "'My dear Rose, would it be suitable? "'Oh, nobody remembers that horrid old story now.' "'Upon this I took out of my pocket a portrait of the King of Ruritania.' It had been taken a month or two before he ascended the throne. She could not miss my point when I said, putting it into her hands, "'In case you have not seen, or not noticed, a picture of Rudolf V, there he is. Don't you think they might recall the story, if I appeared at the court of Ruritania?' My sister-in-law looked at the portrait, and then at me. "'Goodness gracious!' she said, and flung the photograph down on the table. "'What do you say, Bob?' I asked. Burlesdon got up, went to a corner of the room, and searched in a heap of newspapers. Presently he came back with a copy of the Illustrated London News. Opening the paper, he displayed a double-page engraving of the coronation of Rudolf V at Strelsau. The photograph and the picture he laid side by side. I sat at the table fronting them, and as I looked I grew absorbed. My eye travelled from my own portrait to Zapt, to Strakens, to the rich robes of the cardinal, to Black Michael's face, to the stately figure of the princess by his side. Long I looked, and eagerly. I was roused by my brother's hand on my shoulder. He was gazing down at me with a puzzled expression. "'It's a remarkable likeness, you see,' said I. "'I really think I had better not go to Ruritania.' Rose, though half-convinced, would not abandon her position. "'It's just an excuse,' she said pettishly. "'You don't want to do anything. Why, you might become an ambassador.' "'I don't think I want to be an ambassador,' said I. "'It's more than you ever will be,' she retorted. And "'That is very likely true, but it is not more than I have been. The idea of being an ambassador could scarcely dazzle me. I had been a king.' So pretty Rose left us in dudgeon, 
and Burlesdon, lighting a cigarette, looked at me still with that curious gaze. "'That picture in the paper,' he said. "'Well, what of it? It shows that the king of Ruritania and your humble servant are as like as two peas.' My brother shook his head. "'I suppose so,' he said. "'But I should know you from the man in the photograph.' "'And not from the picture in the paper?' "'I should know the photograph from the picture. "'The picture's very like the photograph, but—' "'Well, it's more like you,' said my brother. "'My brother is a good man and true, "'so that for all that he is a married man and mighty fond of his wife, "'he should know any secret of mine. "'But this secret was not mine, and I could not tell it to him. "'I don't think it's as much like me as the photograph,' said I boldly. "'But anyhow, Bob, I won't go to Strelsau.' "'No, don't go to Strelsau, Rudolph,' said he. "'And whether he suspects anything, or has a glimmer of the truth, I do not know. "'If he has, he keeps it to himself, and he and I never refer to it. "'And we let Sir Jacob Borrowdale find another attaché.' "'Since all these events, whose history I have set down, happened, I have lived a very quiet life at a small house which I have taken in the country. The ordinary ambitions and aims of men in my position seem to me dull and unattractive. I have little fancy for the whirl of society, and none for the jostle of politics. Lady Burlesdon utterly despairs of me. My neighbours think me an indolent, dreamy, unsociable fellow. Yet I am a young man, and sometimes I have a fancy. The superstitious would call it a presentiment that my part in life is not yet altogether played, that somehow and some day I shall mix again in great affairs. I shall again spin policies in a busy brain, match my wits against my enemies, brace my muscles to fight a good fight, and strike stout blows. Such is the tissue of my thoughts, as, with gun or rod in hand, I wander through the woods or by the side of the stream. Whether the fancy will be fulfilled, I cannot tell. Still less whether the scene that, led by memory, I lay for my new exploits, will be the true one, for I love to see myself once again in the crowded streets of Strelsau, or beneath the frowning keep of the castle of Zender. Thus led, my broodings leave the future, and turn back on the past. Shapes rise before me in long array. The first wild revel with the king, the rush with my brave tea-table, the night in the moat, the pursuit in the forest, my friends and my foes, the people who learnt to love and honour me, the desperate men who tried to kill me. And from amidst these last comes one who alone of all these yet moves on earth, though where I know not, yet plans, as I do not doubt, wickedness, yet turns women's hearts to softness, and men's to fear and hate. Where is young Rupert of Hentzau, the boy who came so nigh to beating me? When his name comes into my head, I feel my hand grip, and the blood move quicker through my veins, and the hint of fate, the presentiment, seems to grow stronger and more definite, and to whisper insistently in my ear that I have yet a hand to play with young Rupert. Therefore I exercise myself in arms, and seek to put off the day when the vigour of youth must leave me. One break comes every year in my quiet life. Then I go to Dresden, and there I am met by my dear friend and companion, Fritz von Thalenheim. Last time his pretty wife Helga came, and a lusty crowing baby with her. And for a week Fritz and I are together, and I hear all of what falls out in Strelsau. And in the evenings, as we walk and smoke together, we talk of Zapt and of the King, and often of young Rupert. And as the hours grow small, at last we speak of Flavia. For every year... Fritz carries with him to Dresden a little box. In it lies a red rose, and round the stalk of the rose is a slip of paper, with the words written, Rudolph, Flavia, always. And the like I send back by him. That message and the wearing of the rings are all that now bind me and the Queen of Ruritania. For, nobler as I hold her for the act, she has followed where her duty to her country and her house led her, and is the wife of the king, uniting his subjects to him, 
by the love they bear to her, giving peace and quiet days to thousands by her self-sacrifice. There are moments when I dare not think of it, but there are others when I rise in spirit to where she ever dwells. Then I can thank God that I love the noblest lady in the world, the most gracious and beautiful, and that there was nothing in my love that made her fall short in her high duty. Shall I see her face again? The pale face and the glorious hair? Of that I know nothing. Fate has no hint, my heart no presentiment. I do not know. In this world, perhaps nay, it is likely never. And can it be that somewhere, in a manner whereof our flesh-bound minds have no apprehension, she and I will be together again, with nothing to come between us, nothing to forbid our love? That I know not, nor wiser heads than mine. But if it be never, if I can never hold sweet converse again with her, or look upon her face— or know from her her love? Why, then, this side the grave I will live as becomes the man whom she loves, and for the other side I must pray a dreamless sleep. End of The Prisoner of Zender by Anthony Hope Read by Andy Minter